Okay, hi everyone. How's it going? How's the week been? Good? All right, you're supposed to say that. That's good. Good job. That's the right answer. That's the first quiz. Um, my name is Bing Brunton. Um, I am an assistant professor here in the biology department. Um, I'm a computational neuroscientist. So I, I, I used to do quite a bit of experimental work um, in my PhD, so I've, I've scraped my share of rat poop off my shoes. Um, uh, and, then, and then one day I decided that, hey, I really like math and coding, and um, let's, just, let's just do that full time, which is sort of the short version of the story. My lab no longer does any experiments, um, but we do a lot of data analysis, and we work with all kinds of different people. Um, so the kinds of experiments of data that we work with um, range from insects to rodents to non-human primates to humans. Um, so, so I sort of do all of all of that. Um, I, I, are, how many of you here are primarily, I know this is sort of like a neuro hack week, but there's sort of a pretty strong neuroimaging emphasis. How many of you are working on neuroimaging in particular? And how many of you are not, or, or have worked on not neuroimaging type of data? Okay, that's a fair fraction. That's good. Um, okay, so so um, I don't personally. I will yeah, I confess. I don't personally have a lot of experience working with neuroimaging data, with the, the exception of work with James Kunert Graf right there. Um, so so we have some ongoing work, um, and uh, I think he already knows a lot of what I'm telling you um, today. And um, James, if I see if I say something stupid about DMD, you will correct me. Okay, good. So. Um, so what I'm talking about today is a um, is a set of is a set of techniques um, that I think are are pretty cool in terms of working with time series data. So um, so what do I mean by time series data? Um, kind of stuff like that. Okay. So I stare at this stuff all day long, um, and it's it doesn't really matter what it is what this particular data set is for the for the moment, um, except that that we know that in in biology and in neuroscience in particular. Um, a lot of the interesting features are, are not measurements in space, but rather in measurements in time, right? Things change, and um, that change is really important because change is life, right? Things have changed, then we're probably not going to be alive, and so that's really important for analyzing biological data. Um, and so a lot of the, lot of the very powerful techniques um, that people have been using to analyze data in general, right? If you think about Twitter data or Facebook data or image data, large image databases on the internet, um, these really powerful machine learning techniques that people have been using, there's a large class of them that don't really consider time explicitly, right? Like you can apply them to time data, but they don't really care about time as something that's distinct and special um, from, from spatial data. And um, and you can use them, um, but but I think I think in biology and in neuroscience in particular, there's a strong argument to be made that time is special, um, and that the, the time the temporal dimension is distinct and should be treated differently than the spatial dimension. Um, and so there's a set of techniques that we can use for for dealing with that. Um, this particular data set happens to come um, from a human patient um, implanted with an array of electrodes in um, on the surface of their cortex. So, so for, for um, a scale, each of those dots is an electrode. The center to center distance is about a centimeter. So that's covering you no know, big hunk of their cortex, kind of like this right here. Um, each line is the voltage in, um, in one electrode. And I'm showing you about a few seconds worth of data. Um, and in reality, we work with days and days of this stuff. Um, so it gets, it gets really complicated really fast. And now, fortunately, what we are actually able to do is we look at this data, and, and the first thing we say, aha, great, this is not noise. Okay, this is always relief when I see data sets. I'm like, okay, the step one, this is not noise. I don't like analyzing noise. I like analyzing things um, that have some structure. And so the structures we have here, um, if you'll notice, are that, um, and this is what everyone does, that they describe these kinds of signals in terms of oscillations. Because you see that there's parts of it that seem like they're almost sinusoidal, at least for some part of the time. Um, so there's obviously temporal structures. And uh, also, importantly, there seems to be correlations in space as well. So I told you each line corresponds to an electrode. Each electrode is over a slightly different part of cortex. And so when you see um, different lines that look like they have the same up and down deflections at the same time, that means there must be some correlations in space as well. And this is also good. So, so we have structures in time. We have structures in space. And what we're left with is a task of characterizing that spatial temporal structure. 
So we want to be to do time series analysis, but we also want to do time series analysis with space in mind, because we often have lots and lots of measurements in space. If this happens to be narrow imaging functional MRI data, then it corresponds to either the number of voxels or the number of ROIs that you care to be, to be putting your circles around. So that would be the number of measurements you have. So it could be potentially a very, very large number, right? It could be a small number, but it could be a very large number as well. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Um, so if I handed you some data that looks like this, and it's a matrix, what would you do with it? Clean, hmm? clean it. Clean it. Great. Tell us how you would clean it. Um, for for each of this data, like uh, so, if it's ECOG data, it's probably not eye movement artifacts and motion artifacts um, as much. Not very big. So so okay. let, let's pretend that that's not too bad. Uh, Filter out frequencies that are higher than Nyquist of whatever something that we have. Sure. Okay. Okay. So you can you can do some filtering. Yeah. Okay. How do you do the filtering? Um, first, was it just do like a simple bandpass or something like that? Okay. So how does one do it? Can you explain? Does anyone know what a bandpass filter is? Okay. Okay. Good. So you do a bandpass filter. How do you actually do? Okay. So I hand this to you as a matrix, right? So, so rows, uh, let's, let's assume time goes horizontally because that's what my picture looks like. Time goes horizontally, right? So each row is, each row is one electrode in time, right? And columns are snapshots in time. So how would you do this filtering you're talking about? I'd go to my computer and tell it to do it for me. Yeah, I, I know. Just, okay. you know, the math is, is beyond my comprehension and that I would just trust that someone else knows how to do it. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so let me, let me ask a more leading question then. So, so would you do it uh, one snapshot at a time or would you do it one channel at a time? Um, or, or something else? I would do channel-wise across yes. the whole... Um, the whole time series. Okay, so you would apply some functional transformation, that's this filtering thing, yes. and you would apply it to every channel one at a time. For filtering, yes. For during. okay, cool, that's filtering. Okay, great, so let's say we, we filtered it. We filtered every channel, we got rid of at least the, the horrendously noisy stuff that we suspect to be not real. Okay, so now what do we do? Probably correlate. Correlate, correlate what? Correlate between channels. Correlate between channels. So now we're doing something in space, yes. right? So we're looking at each snapshot, and we're computing something like the correlation coefficient. Pairwise? Um, pairwise. Pairwise. Okay, you get, that's easy to do. Okay, that's, that's great. Okay, so, so there's a suggestion of something we can do one channel at a time, uh, followed by something we can do uh, one snapshot at a time. Great ideas. Anyone else would do anything else? Again, like, I'm not telling you, telling you what the data is. I'm not telling you what a person is doing. I'm just going to hand you this matrix of data. What would you do with it? You could do... Uh Canonical correlations with the, the, the data as you've got it pictured there, and uh -huh. maybe the data time shifted, so sort of autocorrelation. Okay, great. Okay, so let's let's talk about those two great ideas one at a time. So you said canonical correlation analysis. Is it? Can you explain very briefly what that is? It's uh, like instead of one x and one y, so bivariate correlation. Uh -huh. It's a bunch of x's and a bunch of y's, and you get. Uh, matrices back, so sort of multivariate correlation. Okay, very good. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. And the second thing you said is autocorrelation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how would you do autocorrelation analysis on something like this? Yeah, so if your x is the time series, mm -hmm. your y could be uh, the time series one point to the future to mm -hmm. the end with a zero at the beginning or the end. Okay. Okay, so so again, would that be something you do to the whole data matrix, or would you be doing it one channel at a time? So I would I do it uh, matrix wise. Is this sort of the canonical correlation setup? Uh -huh. Would be x would be real time, and y would be time minus one or time plus one. Okay. Of the of the full set. All right. Good. Okay. So 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 I think and. Um, are, are there any, does anyone else have anything that jumps to the front of their head in terms of what would you do with the data, data matrix that I just handed you? The FFT on the channels. FFT, that's how you do filtering, yes. No, I would, I would, I would actually do uh -huh. the to look at the power in the different frequencies just to see what the phase of the power source is. Like a spectrogram? No, um, yes, okay, but like, I'm just, yeah, you can also do a spectrogram. You can right. also do a spectrogram. Yep. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Great. So, so we know that. So, so some of the things that I'm hearing from you are there's lots of things that we can do one channel at a time, uh, including changing the data from the time domain to the spec to the spectral frequency domain. Right. Do a do a FFT, do a spectrogram, do whatever it is you like. Your favorite wave algorithm. You can do that. 
Um, there are things that you can do in space in terms of, let's say, correlating pairs of, of um, pairs of channels uh, or pairs of observations. Um, you can do that with cross correlation. You can do yourself a kind of correlation analysis. There's a various games that we can play there. Okay. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, and uh, what I'm going to attempt to 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 show you today is um, something else that that we've also been working on that is somewhat related to some of these techniques. So before I tell you what it is, um, I will just show you what it does uh, on a simple example. Okay. So, so here is a really simple example of dimensionality reduction. So I told you earlier that when I look at this data, my, my first thought is, is it, is it just pure noise? And I'm always relieved when it's not pure noise. Um, and so when it's not pure noise, I'm thinking to myself, OK, so this is really high dimensional data. It's got a ton of numbers. How can I describe the set of numbers in a simpler way? Right? That's usually a good thing we can do in science, is to try to explain complex phenomena in relatively simple terms. How can we do that? So, um, here I have a synthetic data set that I totally made up, um, and uh, I made it up, which means I know the right answer. So hopefully the right answer will be obvious to you as well. So here's my data. Uh, my data is movie. It's 80 pixels by 80 pixels. So it's a 6,400 pixel movie that, that plays in time. Okay? Um, now, fortunately, this is not, there's not actually 6,400 uh, 6, things happening in this movie. Right? If there were, it would just look like total junk, and it doesn't. How many things are happening in this movie? It's less than 6,400. Two. Two. Okay, does anyone think, does anyone disagree with two? Do you think there's three, four, a hundred? Four. You think there's four? Okay, can you describe the four? have two color changes and two shapes. Two color changes and two shapes. Um, I see the two colors and I see the two shapes. Can you collapse them? Yeah. Oh, two. So two, right? Okay. So so yes, you're correct. There's there's a set of color changes and there's, there's two shapes. Okay, but we can collapse them and into two two descriptions. Can you can you say at least in human English words what those two things are? Can you describe them? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, it looks like it's going from warm to cold. Uh huh. Yep. And there's an oval and a square. Great. Okay. So that's exactly that, that's good. I mean, again, like I made the data, so I know the right answer, right? I literally made an oval, <laughs> and I made it go from warm to cold, and then I made a square, and I made the square also go from warm to cold. Right? I made the data. That's the right answer. The right answer. There's two things happening, and it's exactly um, what what was said back there. I'm sorry. What's your name? Grace. Okay. So this is exactly as Grace described. Okay. So so the right answer is that there's two things going on, and so the right answer is whatever it is I want to do to this data set, this high dimensional movie data set. I want those two answers out. I want it to give me an oval. I want it to give me to me a square, and I want it to tell me how they're varying in time. Okay. Can you just by staring at it sort of roughly describe, again, in human English words, how they're varying in time, how the oval and square are varying in time? Just to eyeball it. It's oscillatory. The oval has a lower frequency than the square. OK, does, it, does that make sense to everyone? Can you convince yourself that, that what Dan said is true? OK, it looks like it's oscillatory. It's hard to eyeball if it's actually sinusoidal or not. It happens to be exactly sinusoidal, but you can't tell that. It looks like it's oscillatory, and it looks like one of them is going faster than the other. Right? It looks like the square is going faster than the other. So that's the right answer. We want, I want an oval, and I want a square. And I want that one of them is oscillating faster than the other. That's the right answer. OK, so what's the first thing I do to try to, to, try to do that? How do I reduce the dimensionality of this data set? I think you said it. Do you want to say it louder? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, if it's linear, we, we should try SVD first. Great, let's SVD it. All right, let's SVD it. Uh, otherwise, known as PCA. Whatever, it's the same thing. <laughs> OK, so you try PCA on this, and that's the answer you get. OK, so um, to its credit, um, if you look at singular values, um, the first two are large, the others are practically zero. So it tells you this, that there are two things happening in this data set instead of 6,400, which is great. But if you look at the first two um, singular vectors, I reshaped them and plotted them there, and you get the oval and the square overlapping. 
So it's not actually separating out the two spatial modes in a clean way. And the reason it's not is because they're spatially overlapping, right? They're pixels that participate in both things. Um, and uh, PCA slash SVD is, is not going to be able to be, be able to separate those out nicely. Okay, great. So that, that got us part of the way there. What do I do next? Hmm? ICA. ICA, okay. Let's do ICA. Here's ICA. Okay. Um, and ICA, we already knew we should be looking for two modes because we already did SVD, so we know there's two modes. So we, do, we run two, two component S, um, ICA, and here is the result. Now, ICA does a bit better than SVD. You get that there is a square, and you get there's an oval. Um, the oval is not as clean as I like, right? Because the, um, the original movie, I added a bit of noise to it. Um, and say again? Ah, yes, sure, yes. I'm, 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 I'm applying SCA in the most stupid way possible. I recognize that there are decades of work trying to make this work better. And it is absolutely possible to make it do better than this. You're correct. Yeah. But I'm just, again, I, to, just to illustrate the point, I'm doing the most stupid way possible. Like, just like, you know, you go on Google, you type in ICA, you download the first script that comes down, and then I, you can run. It's more of a thing that I do I say. No, 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 that's great. No, no, you're, you're, you're correct, yes. And, and with, with the other one as well, you can, there's things that could be done, right? A more, more sophisticated noise model, other assumptions, various things. Okay, so um, I will attempt to tell you today about something else that we've been working on called dynamic mode decomposition. Um, and dynamic window decomposition kind of automatically gives you both the things that I constructed that I'm looking for. So what ICA gives you are two modes. It tells you that one is a square, the other is an oval, and it tells you there are oscillatory, and it gives you the frequencies of oscillation of each of the modes. Okay? So uh, I'll tell you about how that works. Is that good? Okay. Um, so that's the only slide I really care to show you today. I have a lot more slides. We can go there later if you want to. Um, but I'm going to start writing on the board. If I say something that doesn't make sense to you, please just holler. And uh, I will stop and attempt to explain. Is there a way I can just make this go dark without turning it off? You think? Yeah, if you hit the standby, it turns off. Standby, back. excellent. Oh, okay, yeah, because I don't want to turn it off. Okay. Um, all right. So, so I showed you, I showed you um, um, a DMD and, uh, and 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 compared it, at least roughly speaking, in its output to to PCA and ICA. Um, the key difference between DMD and PCA and ICA is that, P, is that PCA and ICA are inherently static techniques. You um, have snapshots of data and you're considering them independently. So, I'll, I'll try to define exactly what I mean by that. So, let's say I have uh, data. And I'm going to call each snapshot of data x um, indexed by time. Okay, so I'm going to take all the all the data that I'm taking at time k and stack it into a tall skinny vector. So if I'm doing EFIS, this would be all the channels that I have. If I'm doing imaging, this would be all of the voxels I have. If I'm doing calcium imaging, this could be either pixels of the image or it could be all the little cells that I've already isolated, whatever it is, right? Um, so so this. I don't know, if I'm taking it out of the ocean, it would be every buoy I have in the ocean. Okay, so that would be each row is a, is a measurement, each column is, um, is, a, time, is a time snapshot. Okay, so, and then I kind of stack them up like this, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so that's my data. I'm going to call this big X. Okay, um, so, so if you run something like an SVD on this matrix, um, what you're doing is you're saying that I'm going to take this one matrix um, and I'm going to um, make it um, the product of at least two other matrices. I'm kind of hiding the middle one. Um, approximately equal to something like something like this. Does that work? Attempting to truncate. I think I'm doing a bad job. Just time. Uh, era. Something like that work? Okay. 
Um, so what I'm saying is that if I take my data matrix X, right, where there's this time and this is space, I'm going to attempt to separate it into the product of two other matrices and hopefully separate out the contributions of space and time. And as it is, this is very under-constrained. There's a gazillion different ways you can do this. Um, but the way that something like PC and ICA do it, if you simply shuffle all of the time, all of, all, all of time, so, so instead of taking sequences of snapshots, you can just say, I pretend I don't, know what the I don't know what the time stamps of any of my measurements were, run it, you'll get exactly the same, you'll get exactly the same decomposition, right? It's just all the, the, all the columns in time will be shuffled, but the answer will be the same. As in, what I basically said is that it, this, this technique doesn't care about time, okay? Yes. So that means that if you apply that to what you just showed us, mm -hmm. it does, didn't need that period of severe or anything. PCA would have. PCA this. would have been exactly the same thing. So if you if you if you literally take that, if you take this matrix, right? So you take the video I showed you, you vectorize each snapshot, and then you say, give me a random permutation of times of times. Yeah. Reshape your your data matrix that way. Run PCA. It'll give you exactly the same answer. Yeah. Just the device. Yeah, it's just that right. if you keep track of where the time snapshots are, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just be shuffled. And the answers will be no different. Is, is the problem there, or not the problem, but the, the reason, because it's trying to decomposite space and time in two separate things, where it's really, they're, they're really related in what we were looking at? It doesn't know about time. It doesn't know about time. Yes, exactly right. right okay. Yeah, it just, it just literally doesn't know about time. It thinks they're samples, right? It could be totally independent samples of totally random things. Right. And it could be random individuals and time. It just doesn't know anything about time. Right, time is not is not used as a constraint. So, what would you do if you wanted to use time as a constraint? Okay. So, what we can do is uh, let's just go back to one dimension because it's much easier. And uh, let's say that I have in one dimension a um, time series data in one dimension. So, x zero, x one, x two. These are just numbers. A single series of numbers. Right. So, what's a really simple model in time that I can build off of just the string of numbers that I collected in time. Let's say this is the, the number of steps that I took every day. Right, so this is the number of steps I took today, number of steps I took tomorrow, number of steps the next day, stuff like that. Differentiate or integrate or something. Okay, good. Okay, so you can, you can differentiate and you, or you can integrate. Uh, what kind of model can you build on top of that? Let's, let's take the differential one. First, okay. So, so I can I can say for for every for every time I can say x k minus x k minus one, right? So difference between every day and, and yesterday. I can compute that quantity. I can compute that quantity for every day and the following day, right? Okay. So what do I do on top of that? Give you another hint for those of you who um, have almost certainly seen this in a differential equations class. What if instead of steps, it's this is like the number of bunnies? Okay, so this is number of bunnies in year zero, number of bunnies in year one, number of bunnies in year two. What do bunnies do? Hmm? They multiply. They make more of themselves, right? What determines the number of bunnies and number of new bunnies that you will get every year? Number of bunnies in the previous year. Exactly. Okay. So the change between the number of bunnies and the previous year, the growth in the number of bunnies is dependent on the number of bunnies. Right? Okay. So if x equals the number of bunnies, then I can write a simple differential model where I say the change in the number of bunnies is equal to some coefficient times the number of bunnies. Right? That makes sense. And that will be a fair approximation of what would happen if you just had a bunch of bunnies and you let them make more of themselves. Right? OK. Would it be k minus 1? Hmm? Alpha x? You're correct. Yes, very good. Thank you. I usually write k plus 1, but I did it wrong. You're right. Yeah, that's right. OK? Now, if you wanted to be a um, slightly more sophisticated, you might say, oh, but you know, if maybe it's not entirely dependent on just what's happening this year. Maybe there was a bit of a history effect as well. 
Maybe it also depends on what happened the year before that with a different coefficient. Right? Um, this is a class of models known as autoregressive models. Right? Basically, things happening now is some function of what happened in the past. It could be uh, strictly a function of what happened in one step in the past. It could be a function of what happened in the past and a bit before that. Um, these models are really popular and because they're so simple. And uh, they actually explain a lot of observations really well, like gambling, for example. Um, so, so all these tasks where you have to bet on one arm versus the other arm, there's a lot of evidence that, that the way that people that people are betting is strongly dependent on what happened um, the previous round and, and the previous trial to that, and then eventually you'd expect these coefficients to die down, right? So, because you, you can keep stacking them up, right? You can go all the way down to, um, uh, I don't know, do we want to do this backwards? Um, we can do like, you know, a sub j, x, k minus j, right? Where j could be a large number. Now, you might suspect, just intuitively, that if j got big enough, surely a sub j must be zero. Right? In a reasonable system, you can say that, like, whatever is happening now is not dependent on what happened a million years ago. Okay? So you can kind of say, like, okay, so I'm not going to, after some point, my model is no longer, there's not an infinite number of coefficients, I hope. So I can write a simpler model by making these coefficients smaller. Okay? Now, these models, explicitly depend on time, right? Okay, so, so what we can do with this um, is then try to expand this to work in multiple dimensions. So this is one time series. Uh, what if there's more than one observation and they're interdependent? So the continuum between here and here is that if x is no longer a scalar value but actually a vector, then um, I can write something like x k plus 1 minus x k. So this is, these are now vectors, is dependent on the coefficient that becomes a matrix, right? So I have a square matrix. This is my A matrix times x of k. Yes? Is x uh, sub k the same thing as like a vectorized version of that photo of the yes okay yes or at least in my conception it is yeah, yeah. yeah that's where I'm trying to get to yeah. Yeah. Like vectorized version of the photo like the the things we were seeing earlier like the the, the, the oval and the square okay. yeah the vectorized right. version of those times shots oh. does that make sense okay so this this is just a vectorized version of that it's a vectorized autoregressive model and I've made it so that it's only one step and I'm just not writing down the other steps. Essentially, you're assuming that they're gonna to go to zero. Okay? Now, um, I can simplify this a tiny bit further. So this is a differential version of the model. Um, we can also just straight up write a discrete time version of the model by saying that I'm defining a different A that takes me from every step to the subsequent step. They're kind of equivalent, it doesn't really matter, right? You'll just get a different A. But the assumptions being made here are the same. So this A takes you from every time to the step. This one takes you from every time to the next time. So A is sort of my, my stepping function operator. It takes you from one step to the second step, right? Okay, now, what is the size of A here? So supposing I have uh, one measurement, the time, A is a single number. If I have two measurements in time, what's the size of A? Two by two. If I have n measurements, what's the size of A? N by n, right? OK, so I hope you'll appreciate that for small numbers of n, you can just go ahead and fit A, right? If I have like um, uh, bunnies and foxes, right, and all of that in time, and you go to Yellowstone, you measure these things, you get them from the ecologists, you go ahead and fit yourself a, a little autoregressive model. I have four numbers to fit, and I can get a model for A. And it'll oscillate, it'll go up and down, okay? Great. Now, what if I have a lot of measurements? Exactly right. <laughs> Very good. So A is 
m by n, okay? Where x is an Rn. So when n is small, I can just go ahead and fit these autoregressive models. If n becomes large, okay? So let's say you're doing a functional MRI, a functional MRI experiment. Um, how, how, what's n here? What's a typical number for n? Voxels. Sure. How many voxels you got? Hundred. Hundred thousand. A hundred thousand, right? So, so what's the size of a then? A hundred thousand by a hundred thousand. That's a lot of numbers. Do I really think I can I can estimate those numbers? Why can I not estimate those numbers? Because your t is tiny. Kids for like forty hours. Right, because you don't have the data, right? That's one reason. One reason is you don't have enough data, right? The number of data points you have is much smaller than the size of A. So I can't do that. Uh, what's, another, what's another reason? Like memory? Memory, yes. So at, at the 100,000 by 100,000 square matrix is gigantic. And I don't want to compute that. I can't compute that on my laptop. I'm going to have to get a large computer. This is just a mess, right? One, I don't want to, I don't, I can't compute it. And even if I could compute it, I can't without buying a very, very short <coughs> computer. So, so these models are not terribly useful, right? They kind of work for smaller systems, but this whole framework, as I've set it up, is kind of a disaster um, once you have a lot of measurements. So, so what do we do? Well, we're going to go back and uh, play some tricks. And we, we go back and we say, OK, so I've taken linear algebra and I've taken differential equations. And I've seen differential models of this kind, OK? Um, what do, I, what do I actually mean when I want to find A? Let's say A is a small matrix. A is a two by two matrix because I have, I have bunnies and foxes, right? What would you do once you fit a two by two matrix to your data and you have an A? How do you characterize the system? A, a is like the characterization of the system, right? Um, a is a description of the system. Yes, that's right. Or at least like how the things interact. To that's the right. Okay. Um, diagonalize it. Diag like how do you diagonalize it? SPD. You can do an SPD. Okay, so you can, it's a square matrix, so we're going to do something slightly simpler, which is that you're going to take the eigen decomposition of A. Right? Does that make sense? So, so to characterize a square matrix that describes all of my dy dynamics, especially you want to know, if you want to characterize the, the stability of A, right? If you want to say like, is this system going to blow up in finite time or not? The way you do that is by taking the eigen decomposition of A, right? Even if you had a two by two matrix, because it's a, sometimes it's a little hard to see by eye whether or not a matrix A is going to blow up in finite time or not. So, so you do that, you take its eigen decomposition. So we're going to use that trick here. We're going to say, okay, so if I had a 10,000 or 100,000 by 100,000 matrix A, right? I don't actually care about A. I don't actually want to know A per se. I want to know the eigen decomposition of A, right? So is it possible for me to compute the eigen decomposition of A without actually computing A? Especially if I make the assumption that A, because it's so gigantic and the system doesn't even have that much data, right? We don't have 80 hours of data. We maybe have a few minutes of data. Maybe only all I care about are the leading eigenvalues of A, the biggest ones, the most important ones the ones that don't die down immediately. So is it possible for me to, uh, to get the leading significant eigenvalues of A without actually computing A? Because I don't want it in my laptop. Right? OK, so, so let's, let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here, and um, I'm going to make exactly that assumption. So x is going to be a vectorized version of my snapshots. Um, so snapshot, 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 snapshot of n dimensions, whatever n is. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to attempt to derive the eigen decomposition of A without actually computing A, because that's all I really want. Furthermore, I want to be able to compute the leading R eigen decomposition, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of A without computing A, because you know, if I knew something about the, the actual dimensionality of the system, I should be able to compute those without computing the rest of it. Right? It's just kind of a waste of time. They're really small, hopefully. Right? Okay. So I'm going to define one more matrix here. So I've defined an X matrix. I'm going to define one more matrix, which I am going to call my Y matrix. OK? And the Y matrix looks really similar to my X matrix. Minus one here. OK. 
So I have two data matrices. I have all my data, and I'm stacking them up two different ways. I'm going to stack them into an X matrix and a Y matrix. And they're almost exactly identical. They're identical in size, and they're also almost identical. The only difference is that one of them, the Y matrix, is shifted over by one DT. Now what that gets me is that the X matrix, column-wise, if you step from every, every, every column of X to every column of Y, is one snapshot in time. It's one DT. Right? In other words, I can write a vectorized version, I can write a matrix version of this vectorized equation, and I can say that y equals ax. Right? Same a as over here. Yes? Is the back side, so you said they're the same size, so have you like taken the first element of x and put it on the appendage of the back of y? Uh, I have not. Um, I have chopped oh, off the last oh, element okay. and then put it down here. Oh, okay. Right. So, so at all times, there's a column-wise uh, 1 dt relationship. Okay. Right. It actually doesn't even matter that they are these are acquired in regular intervals as long as every pair of columns is separated by a constant. And there's another algorithm you can do when they're not, but that's a little more complicated. This is this one's easier to write down. Okay. Um, so that's why we, yeah, we lose, we lose one time, right? So there's an extra one in front and there's an extra one in the back, okay? So this is my equation. X and Y are data, X is un, A is unknown. Once again, if this is small enough, you can just go ahead and solve it. You have pseudo inverse, you can solve yourself for an A, right? But we're in the limit where potentially A is very large and we don't want to actually just solve for it. So we're gonna do a little bit of linear algebra. Um, and what we're gonna do, um, is take advantage of the SVD. So step one is we're going to take the SVD. I'm going to take my x, and I'm going to say that x equals u sigma v star. Okay? Do that on my computer. This is fine. Right. As long as I can fit x in my, in my memory, I can compute the SVD of x. So then I'm going to substitute this back there, and I'm going to say y equals ax, so it's a u sigma v star. So far so good? Okay. I'm going to left multiply by u star. So u star y equals u star a u sigma v star. Okay? All right. So there's this object here that has starting to come out, which is u star a u. I'm going to call that a tilde. And it's going to equal to this stuff moved over here, right? So a tilde is defined as uh, u star y v sigma inverse, right? So this comes from the data, um, and these three quantities come from the SVD of x. So I can just go ahead and compute myself in a tilde, OK? Now, because of the magic of the SVD, I don't have to do with this with the full SVD of x. I can do it with a truncated SVD of x, right? I can just take the first number of modes of the SVD, which is guaranteed to explain as much of the variance as possible given that's the number I want, okay? So SVD magic, we're going to say that I'm gonna pick the first R singular vectors. So instead of using all of them, I'm gonna pick the first R, right? So I'm going to propagate that through. So y is approximately equal to a times uh, u sub r, sigma sub r, v sub r, u sub r, u sub r, u sub r, sigma sub r, v sub r, sub r, sub r, sub r. OK? Now, remember, a used to be uh, gigantic. a tilde. is r by r. I get to pick r. In the movie I showed you, I can pick r equals 2. Right? So the data used to be 6400 dimensional, so a would have been 6400 by 6400, which is not unmanageably large, but it's pretty big. Instead, what I'm going to say is I'm going to pick r equals 2. 
So I think there's two, two things happening. You need, you need a little bit of prior knowledge, right? It's like, okay, I know what's going on. I think R is two. So I'm gonna pick R equals two, and I compute myself for myself this matrix here, uh, which is now a two by two matrix. I can take the eigendecomposition of a two by two matrix, right? So you take the eigendecomposition of a two by two matrix, a tilde, or whatever R is, it's 100 by 100, which is quite manageable, right? And, uh, and you basically say that uh, I can take the eigen decomposition, so I will get a set of eigenvalues. Uh, does it go this way? It goes this way. Okay, so I take the eigen decomposition of A tilde, and what I get is a set, a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A tilde that are the leading eigenvectors and eigenvalues of A. It's s relatively straightforward to just substitute it back in and show that that's true. Yes? Uh, you don't know how many things are going on in your data? Like this, we knew that there were two, but if you don't know, mm -hmm. how do you, what is the criteria to choose R? Ah, there's a little bit of a trick to it. Great question. So if you just have data, right, it could be often very difficult to figure out what, what R should be. Um, so practically speaking, there's a couple of things you can do. One of them is um, how well does this R by R model explain your data? And you can go ahead and try a, a bunch, right? You can just go ahead and cross-validate it. You can just say, I'm going to pick a range of R's. I'm going to construct a bunch of these models. And I'm going to say, how well does this explain my data? And I can pick the one that works the best. Based in the amount of variability explained or just or, yeah, or best in terms of how well does it reconstruct the data is one thing you can do, right? There's other things that you can do as well, but that's one thing you can do that is at least somewhat sensible and driven by the data. Um, the other thing you can do is um, based on, for example, uh, prior knowledge. If this is a physical or biological system that you have some reason from first principles to suspect may be R-dimensional, go ahead and plug that in. Right. If you have some reason to believe it, you can do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, two questions. One, following up on that, if in your example you already said r equal to 10, mm -hmm. would the first two still have uh, been the, the two dimensions that you ended up showing? Or would they have been some kind of like... So, so it's not like the SVD where they're, um, where they come out ranked. Oh. They don't come out ordered. The two I showed will be two of them. Okay. There'll be eight other ones that look like mushy nonsense. Okay. Right. So, so then, if you use your the you know the smell test, where you plot it on your computer and you're a human, you're looking at the modes. You're like, this one looks fine. This one looks fine. These look like nothing. Yeah. And at that point, it will, it will be obvious to you that that eight of these modes don't really do much of anything at all. Okay. Second question mm -hmm. is, if you were to just put one, and there are two, ah, w would it pick one of those, or will it uh -huh. pick some other garbage? That's a great question. Um, in this particular case, because of the way, well, okay, let me, let me do one more thing and then we'll go back to that point, okay? All right, so, so I told you that uh, because of this trick that I've played here, uh, the eigenvectors of A tilde are, are, are eigenvectors up to a transformation of A, and the eigenvalues of A tilde are, are exactly the eigenvalues of A, the leading ones. And what that gives you is that I can essentially project the modes back into regular space, in n-dimensional space, and the eigenvalues I can use because that's the temporal relationship, right? The eigenvalues tell me everything that's happening in time. And what I can do is uh, write a differential model of the original data based on this decomposition. Now I have, a, I have an r-dimensional model of what's going on. So um, the way this would work, um, is that I can say uh, y hat, which is the, my model's version of y, um, is uh, going to be something like um, w eigenvalues to the power k plus some initial conditions. K is time. K is time. K is Snapshot. It's like an index of snapshots. Yeah. All right? Because this is everything that's happening in space. This is everything that happens in time. And I've constrained all the temporal dynamics to be oscillatory. So this is kind of like if you wanted to do 
um, if you wanted to do an, a PCA and an FFT at the same time, right? Because the modes come out sinusoidal and you get spatial modes. The spatial modes are not guaranteed to be orthogonal. You lose that. But they are going to be temporally coherent because they're going to be sums of sinusoids. That makes sense? Okay. And what you can do is because of this lambda to the t, uh, the, to the, t, to the k uh, term um, tells you something about the temporal dynamics. And if you plot the, the spectrum of lambda on the complex plane, and you look like, and you look at what, where these values lie, we're, we're raising this number to the, to, the, to the power of k, right? Which means that if they're inside the unit circle, it's going to decay to, it's going to decay to zero. If it's outside the unicircle, it's going to blow up. And if and only if it's on the unicircle, is it going to be a stable mode? So you can tell a lot about, and depending on how close this is to the unicircle, it'll tell you something about how long, how long it's going to persist. So what's going to happen, if you plug in the wrong number for r, right? so in the example I showed you, if you plug it for 1, what it's going to do is it's going to give you one of those modes. And it can't mix them because it's constrained to be sinusoidal. And the other one, I, I constructed it so they're a relatively prime frequencies, so it won't pick any of the other one. I think it generically picks the lower frequency ones. That's what happens when you, I, I think there must be a good reason for this theoretically, but I've done it a lot and this is what always happens in data, is that when the R is too small, you get the low frequency modes. So is that your, you're sort of trying to, sorry. Yeah, so, so. When you're trying different things out, you would it would look okay until you got to too many. Like too few wouldn't necessarily look bad. Yes, that's exactly right. Too few don't look bad. At some point, it looks better. If you and then after your dimensionality gets too high, it just completely collapses and becomes nonsense, okay. which is hard to tell theoretically where that is. But it's something that's straightforward to do from a data-driven perspective. You just try a bunch and then you look at them. And, and you can plot yourself a curve exactly like you described. Okay. Yep. By becoming nonsense, you mean every new one you have is nonsense, or you mean all the No, the whole thing. Ones? No, the whole model, this entire model collapses. Oh, okay. And starts resembling not your data anymore. I'm sorry, I missed it. Why are they constrained to be sinusoidal? <laughs> Why are they constrained to be sinusoidal? It's, it falls out of the linear algebra, oh. is because these eigenvalues are complex valued. Right, so this is a complex number raised to the power k, right, where k is time. So you end up with something that is, uh, is oscillatory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the one thing that's coming to my mind is like motion correction, for example. What, what, how do you mean by motion correction? Like, um, there's, you know, so functional connectivity data is like corrupted a lot by movement uh -huh. in, the, in the scanner, and it's not oscillatory. Uh -huh. It's like however it looks like, you know? Yeah. So if I wanted to use something like this, you would first try to clean the motion out of your data first before mm -hmm. looking, doing this, because otherwise it's going to be labeling motion as sinusoidal when it's actually, when it's... Or well, cardiac or respiratory. If you have that. If you have that, yeah. that too. That's correct. So, so this is you don't you get you don't get something out of nothing. There's no free lunch, right? You get an explicit model in time, but at least in this formulation I've written down, you are you're, you're you're looking for things that are sinusoidal, mm -hmm. just like FFT does, right? It has exactly the same limitations. So if you if you want to reconstruct something that does not look sinusoidal, so let's say that my temporal dynamics looks like the following, and so on and so forth, right? It's just going to do its best and make this as a sum of sinusoids. It does exactly what you think FFT would do. Then you'd find another component. And you, so what you will find is that this one component that is not sinusoidal would end up being decomposed into a number of different components that might look similar, but have slightly different frequency content so that they add up to this. But we have some work trying to address this issue, but in the version I wrote down, it's only looking for sinusoidal things. Suppose there's a uh, suppose there's a shock to the system. Yes. Right? Like a like a step function shock or something. Yeah. Could you convolve that out, or like like you you model that uh -huh. that shock 
uh, and then filter it. So whatever, whatever waveform comes out of it. That's a great question. So um, a colleague of mine developed a version that's called the MDU control, where essentially your model is now the following. So y equals ax plus bu. This is now my shock. So I give it a delta function of whatever. So because if you just did it, it, wouldn't, it would assume that everything is stationary. So if your data is not stationary, it's going to freak out and give you something that doesn't make sense at all. However, if you knew you had an input to the system, you have a U, right? And you knew what it was, for example, you knew precisely when it occurred in your recording, you can put that into the model and that will allow you to estimate both A and B, assuming you knew U. Does that make sense? You, what is U? U is the U is some kind of input. input? Some okay. kind of input. Whatever you want an input to be, an input to the system. So in the context of like motion, for example, mm -hmm. BU could we could know like exactly how many millimeters a person can move, and then we could model it in that. Um, U is the space of U is the space of inputs. So if it's um, I'm gonna I might butcher this, but you mentioned um, breathing artifacts, mm -hmm. right? So presumably it you can put in a different sensor and measure the breathing, right? So you know precisely when the person took a breath. It's fairly regular, but not precisely. But you'll know precisely when they took a breath, right? And then, then that's that's you, right? You would be the time trace of when they took a breath. And then the B, which may or may not be known, is the effect that each breath has on your measurements. Mm. Does that make sense? So you'd have to write a model kind of like this, and there is a way of doing it. That's more complicated than what I wrote down because it has more matrices. So as long as you have a motion tracker on them, you can have the deltas of the motion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Knowing precisely when they happen is the key. Yeah. Does it have to be a delta? Because you could do something that's, that's got a wider band. Okay. Yeah, um, it's easiest to deal with if it's if it's a kick, right? Just yeah. kick the system. Um, if it's not a discrete kick, then the math gets a little bit harder, but you can still kind of do it. Yeah. Does the sampling rate of U need to be faster than the sampling rate of X, or is it okay if they're the same? Um, let's see. I think it's easiest to deal with if they're the same. There's no noise model in that term. There's not an explicit noise model, that's correct. Um, so I talked to a bunch of statisticians one time, and they got really angry at me. Um, and they insisted that I write down a noise model. No, I, I there's an implicit noise model in that Yes, that's right. There is an implicit noise model Which is here. just not, uh, not, not shown, right? It, yes, you're right. And because it's SVD bears, it's probably the version of it, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. So, so um, that's a great point. So we can talk about that for for a second. So, so what you're basically doing is that you're 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 doing a linear regression on the dynamics, right? That's also what we're doing here. So if we go back to uh, let's say we go back to one dimension, right? And I take my data and I plot it as um, x sub k versus x k plus one, right? And I plot all my data, and it's something like this, right? That's A, right? So we're doing linear regression of the dynamics. It's a little harder to draw in many dimensions, but it's still exactly the same thing. We're fitting a high dimensional, higher dimensional linear regression on the dynamics. Now, if you look at regular linear regression, like a least squares regression, right? The implicit noise model is that I want, because I'm writing um, x k plus one as a function of x sub k, right? So the noise, uh, what the error I'm computing is this error is square of these things, right? And that case would be like the uh, alpha to the Which is biased towards the future. Sure. So, um, and, and if you can just kind of picture the same thing here, but in higher dimensions, you're still biased towards the future. So there's small bias towards the future. Um, can you explain what you mean by bias towards the future? So if you do a linear, like a regular linear model of x and y, right? So you want to write a model of y as a function of x, and you just, Solve for the for you do linear regression with a least squares penalty, right? 
So the penalty you're, 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 you're using are, is the square of these vertical lines I'm drawing, right? The deviation of y from the model. I'm not at any point accounting for the deviation of x from the model, because I'm not modeling x, right? You're assuming that you know x precisely. But when you're doing this in dynamics, right, of dynamic data, every dot is just a pair of observations. So in addition to, so that's not the noise model I want, right, when you're doing dynamics. What you actually want is, you maybe want this, right. this error, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so that's not what you get here, unless you did something a little more clever. Um, there's kind of two solutions to this problem. Um, and uh, the first one I like because it's really simple, which is that you just run it twice, forwards and backwards. Right? You do what I just said twice, forwards in time and also backwards in time. You can, if you swap x and y and ran it again, and then essentially cleverly averaged a, you would uh, average out that bias that I just drew over there. The other way to do it would be to do this regression, but instead of doing um, a least squares regression, you do something called a total variation regression, which gives you that diagonal error that you want. So those are two ways to do it. Um, so yeah, so I think it, 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 I'm, it is possible to write down a noise model. Uh, and, and the implicit one is that there's some kind of Gaussian noise um, on your measurements. If it's Gaussian noise, is that why you get a lower frequency given two or four more? So you choose one, one mode, but you have two, the, the ground truth is two. Yeah. So if you only choose one, well, given your noise model is Gaussian, but in frequency space, it's all Gaussian. Yeah. I think that makes sense. That, that seems rather intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. This may be, um, maybe you're going to get to this, but is there a code available to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, it's on GitHub. Uh, we also have a we have a book that has a website. It's called dmdbook.com. Um, so there's some code there as well. Um, I have some code on my GitHub repository. There's also a um, there's a Python library that a bunch of um, I'm not involved in this library, but a bunch of other people wrote it that I know, and it's called Mod Red or something. And it does DMD and a bunch of other things. So Mod Model Reduction. It's a, yeah. And it's all parallelized and friendly with clusters and stuff like that. Is that from the like, Applied Math team here? It's not from the Applied Math team here. It's, uh, it's from um, a group of people um, at, mostly at Princeton, but they've kind of moved on there at different places now. Um, one of them I'm still friends with, and he actually works here um, in, in, uh, in, in the Bangor Navy facility um, in Bremerton. But he still works on the package sometimes. Yeah. Um, but the basic ones, like I, 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 I wrote a couple of functions, but the, the, the plain version is literally four lines of linear algebra. So, so I, I end up retyping these a lot, just because it's four lines of linear algebra. James, are, is there other packages that you use, or do you just kind of code up your own as well? Yeah, there you go. It's four lines of linear algebra. Yep. Does it go to Arima? Hmm? Does it go to Arima too? Um, that one does not, um, but it wouldn't be that hard to do. Yeah. Cool. Um, Thank do you have uh, an example, like, for example, the first slide you saw with all these um, signals? Uh huh. If we apply this method to this example, what would you do with it? Okay. Um, I'll show you if I can. Well, I think I've actually that's all the that's all the time that I that I have, but I'm happy to show you. Um, doing this on some neuroscience data, and, and, and James has some more, too, on, on imaging data, if you'd like to show what the most look like. Thank you. What was the two books you mentioned? What was the two books Mod red, like auto reduction, M O D R E D. Um, 
found something called that. Does it have DMD? <laughs> it does, yeah. It has something called DMD. It has something called POD, yeah. which is essentially yeah. like a fan. It's a cellular version of the SUV. It's listed on that. Yeah, there you go. Um, in case you're curious, this is one example of, um, of using it to extract some modes um, in some sleep econ data. Um, and because you basically have, remember we're talking about this as a linear model, right? So it really doesn't deal with. Um, non-stationarity very well. So it, it, practically speaking, becomes a windowed analysis, right? Because you have to do it in a small enough window so things are approximately linear. So um, you take your data, you run it over windows, you compute the spectra. And here, I know I'm looking for something in this frequency band that has higher than average or have higher than expected power. So every time that happens, you can take down the modes, right? I end up in a library of modes, you do some clustering on the modes, and you end up with different stereotypes of, um, in this case, their, their spindle networks, sleep spindle networks, right? You can kind of map that onto electrode space and visualize them this way. And we read about this in the, in the paper as well, we have to prove it? Yeah, this is in that paper. So the person sleeping with an electrode net? Yep. Yeah, they are. I, I'm actually analyzing the, the, the like the superset of this data. So here we're analyzing about half an hour to an hour's of data per person. Um, but they're actually in the hospital for at least a week. So um, I have a, a related project where we're, we're um, doing unsupervised analyses on, on a week's worth of human data, where they're they're doing. I mean, they're sleeping, they're eating, they're talking to people, all everything. Yeah. Thanks. Alright, that's fine. <laughs>